So I'm going to uh, I'm going to take moderator's privilege by throwing out the first question, and uh, I guess it's directed more at Greg rather than Phil. One of our audience members was specifically interested in, can you point us to your website that you mentioned that's going to be launched and how we can connect with it? Um, yeah, the, the, can, you, can you hear me if I just do this? Yeah. I've never been accused of having a soft-spoken voice. Um, so um, the Humanist Community website, uh, Humanist Community Project website is going to be live uh, at some point in December. I don't have an exact date for you yet. Um, but um, you can sign up at our current website, our old website, is harborhumanist.org, and you can go there to sign up on our mailing list um, so that you can get the update. And I've also got, if you want to fill out uh, one of these cards with you and your information, your mailing information, I would love to send you more information. Um, so. What is the precise website? Uh, Do you know the precise website address at this point? See, I, we will probably put it up initially on uh, harborhumanist.org, so we'll just launch the new website from, from the current website. So just, just go to harborhumanist.org and sign up, and you know, excuse the appearance right now, we've got a very cool website. So folks are starting to hand me some cards with some, some questions on them, and, and maybe I misspoke. My intention with the note cards was to simply give you guys an idea or a, a place to jot down your ideas. I'd, they'd rather hear the questions from you rather than me. So um, although I don't, mind, I don't mind putting these out there, but if you guys would like to jump up, this mic is available. And uh, speak out loud, pull up some chairs, let's get casual, and uh, let's open up this conversation. Hi, um, I'm... A member of this church, and this is directed to Grin toward Greg. Um, it seems to me that it, you're almost talking about a religion itself when you're talking about humanism, um, and especially given the tax situation in the U.S., where as a nonprofit, it gives you advantages. Do you see it in that vein or not? Um. No, humanism is not a religion, in my opinion. Um, there are some people who think it is, there are some people who think it isn't. I'm happy to work with both. I think it's a semantic issue. Um, and, and I think that we need to get past that semantic issue. Uh, you know, some, if there are people who want to call it religious humanism or secular humanism, I mean, it's like the, the, the analogy is, is uh, that there's the gay movement or the queer movement or the LGBT movement or the GLBT, right? I think you can't even get the acronym straight. Um, and yet, the question is, is there a movement that's actually doing something meaningful that you can identify? Um, if we do some things, right? If, you gotta put it to your mouth. Oh, okay, so you actually need more volume? All right, I'm, I apologize. I'm just not used to needing more volume. Um, so, I'll start here, because this, this, is, this is, if we do some things, that religions or religious communities do. Does that make us a religion? Or does it mean that religious groups over the course of human history have simply taken ideas that are useful um, in, adopt, you know, in creating community and mixed them in with all kinds of other ideas that are, to put it charitably, not useful, um, and made this kind of soup? And we're trying to distill it you know, down to some things that are actually useful. If, you know, if we get rid of religion, um, and you know, then we start have to start from scratch with thinking about how do people, you know, how do people organize themselves most effectively to be most supportive and have the best kind of human experience. We're going to probably still take some of the ideas that we got rid of and put them back into something. Um, and so, no, I, I don't call this a really the, the, not, the tax question. It, I think that's a red herring because you know there are plenty of other nonprofits that get this tax benefit too. And so, you know, the, the point is not, you know, let's take tax benefits away from nonprofit organizations, is it? I mean, it, it, the idea is let's create our own effective nonprofit organizations that can serve people um, and build them. Anyway. Thank you. My name's David. I want to know, the, humanism... Is it really a political movement in that regard then, as just more than just a community, obviously? For me, my, I 
became a secular humanist, if you will. I mean, I'm a member of the AHA, but um, because it was a reaction to the religious right for me. I don't care if someone's religious. It doesn't bother me. In fact, I like talking to religious people. You know, there is, I, I have a, an ex, a Muslim friend who says he believes in mythology and allegory, poetry. I like those things. So is humanism a political movement as much as it is a community movement? Do we need to, do we need to um, throw out those who need their, the comfort of their religion? Because who am I to take it away from them? This is one of my biggest conflicts myself is I don't want to take that away from them. Well, I would like to think that humanism is as diverse or almost as diverse as religion. I mean, I would like to think there's a zillion different kind of humanisms. And I would like to think there are some people that are involved in humanism for political reasons. And there are some people involved in humanism because they want their kids to have a summer camp experience. And there are some people involved in humanism because their friend Chuck is involved in humanism. I mean, I would just like to think that it's not one thing and not one motivation, but a, but a, a whole slew, just like any religion you would observe. You know, that's, that would be my short answer. I completely agree. And what I would add to that is um, I think that one part of humanism that has not, I, I haven't often seen emphasized um, in, in the past generation or two, but I think can be a point of emphasis for us today is we actually can work with partners who are religious on all kinds of political projects. And it's to our benefit and to their benefit. Um, the, we have an organized program uh, that we've just named Values in Action um, at our uh, Humanist Community Project uh, Center in Harvard, um, which is an organized program uh, led by a full-time staff person uh, that is uh, engaged in uh, creating community service projects that uh, humanists that can lead and invite members of Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, Baha'i, Zoroastrian groups, etc., to work with us and so it's become this frequent experience in Cambridge or Boston or whatever now where you will have a, a room filled with a couple hundred people, let's say packaging meals or you know, working on a home or uh, doing tutoring or whatever. And the, the, the room was organ this, this gathering was organized by humanists and there are humanist posters around, along the wall. But there are members of congregations of all those different religions that I mentioned in the room. And they're happy to be there. And, you know, the one, at one of these events on 9-11, we, we packaged 10,000 meals uh, for, uh, for food insecure kids in the area. And, uh, you know, we organized it. It was the biggest uh, community service event at Harvard that day. And th these, two, um, these two very cute kids, uh, you know, students come up to me. And they're, they're from the Muslim Student Association at Harvard. And they say, are you Mr. Epstein? And I say, yes. They say, we'd like to give you something. And I say, sure. And it's a check from the uh, Harvard Islamic Society to the humanist chaplaincy at Harvard for $100 for their contribution for uh, this food packaging project. And so we can have, the, you know, the, the, this, this can be something that's sort of a generational marker, you know, religious groups coming to the humanists and saying, here, we, we want to offer you our support for your good work. I want to encourage everybody who has a copy of Ambrose Bierce's Dic Devil's Dictionary. When you, when you get home, look at his definition of immoral. I, I am, am immoral. Adjective, inexpedient. And he, in a long, interesting uh, paragraph, he makes the case that, that uh, anything that in the long run human beings find to be inexpedient, not working, uh, becomes immoral and becomes wicked. And if there's any other basis for this, then the uh, reason is a disorder of the mind and so forth. <laughs> he puts it very brilliantly. Uh, immoral in Devil's Dictionary. Thank you. Uh, you both have mentioned how there's a lot more opportunities for secularists today. Uh, but the one area that I find troubling is uh, when it comes to presidential politics. Uh, in 1960, when John F. Kennedy ran, he ran and he stated that there should be separation from church and state. And it seems like today, you can't be a presidential candidate with that belief. And it seems like today, you pretty much have to be a very religious Christian 
uh, even Obama kind of plays up to that, and those are the only people who are allowed to run and to be president. So if you could comment on that. Thanks. There's no question that that's the case. Two studies came out, I don't know, five or six years ago, when, when Hillary Clinton and Obama were going to be the leaders of the Democratic uh, options, and everybody knew that a Democrat was going to win, so it was either going to be an African-American or a woman. There were all these surveys where people were asked, and also Romney was possible contender. They asked people, you know, if a person was qualified, would you vote for the following, African-American, Latino or Hispanic, a woman, a Jew, a, a Mormon, a, a Muslim, a homosexual, an atheist, blah, 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 and they had all these lists. And there were two separate studies, and in both studies, the people that um, – the average American – these were national survey samples – the, the, the kind of person that came in last was an atheist in both studies. So Americans said they'd be more willing to vote for a Muslim, a homosexual, anything. And atheists always came in last pay, place. So there's no question that Americans don't like the term atheist. They associate it with bad things, with communism, with immorality, and all these things. So there is definitely a stigma. But I would simply say... It's just like anything. It's going to change. The more uh, people start leaving religion, the more humanist groups that emerge, the greater the numbers. You're, and, and this is proof to me. This is proof to me when at Obama's inauguration in, um, what was it, in January? When he, when he, the official inauguration in, in Washington, D.C., where he had, what, Rick... Warren, or you know, he had all these religious guys giving all these official benedictions. But when it was his turn to give his speech, he stood up and said in front of the whole nation, We are a nation of Muslims and Jews and Christians and Hindus and non believers. This is the first time a U.S. president had ever said that. And this was at his inauguration. I mean, it wasn't at some talk at the Harvard Humanist Society. You know, he could have said that at some event somewhere. This was no, not at all. But I mean, you know, presidents. You're invited. Yeah. If you're, if you're watching, you're invited. Indeed. But I mean, we know presidents give talks to different target audiences where they may say things. This was at his inauguration. So the fact that a president included non believers in that list is hugely significant, and it suggests that we are, we're coming out, we're getting known, we're getting uh, nods to now in presidential speeches. So I would assume in 15 or 20 years, the stigma will decrease, more and more politicians will be more comfortable. So I, I think the tide is turning. Uh, the, the GLBT movement in America was unpopular when it was known um, in, in a certain stereotypical way, when it became known as a movement supporting marriage equality, equal, so, you know, equal rights for people who love each other and want to partner with one another for life. Uh, it became much more popular. Uh, when humanists are known for community centers uh, doing work in local cities that, that supports people in their, all the different stages of their lives, regardless of culture, background, ethnicity, uh, that, that, that is getting out and making each city a little bit of a better place, I think we'll do better. Um, and, and by the way, all this obsession with the religious right, um, the religious right became influential. All right? you know, after Carter's election, I mean, you know, they, they, they shifted the tide in American politics uh, towards Reagan and towards this new generation of, of Christian leader. Why? Because they grew in number? Did, did, the, did the religious right or, or conservative Christians grow in number in, you know, in, in the 60s? They didn't. They did not increase in their percentage of the population. What they did was they got involved in politics as an organized cohort in a way that they had not been before. And so the, the electorate in the U.S. used to be very evenly divided. Um, and you know that was without this group of, of very conservative Christians involved. So they got involved and they shifted the, the percentage of people that were voting slightly in favor of conservatives in America. But um, right now we have a sense, we all have the sense, whether liberals or conservatives, that, that the debate about values is between believers and non-believers. And if you want values, you have to go with the believers, right? Because people are always going to think that way. In fact, if you took liberal religious people that I was talking about do, that do a lot of good work in this country and you put them together with the 16% who are non-religious and those people said we've got values and we're going to show you all the values that we have and our values are the values of freedom and democracy and education and science and they really you know, made that case well. In fact, those people are more than 50% of the United States and we would have a decisive majority, especially in the coming generation, if we can partner with our allies and make the conversation about our values. Okay. Uh, I've always had the opinion that uh, the reason why 
Bronze Age myths retain a, a great appeal two, two or 3,000 years after the Bronze Age has ended is because there are many people who are very uncomfortable with ambiguity and with gray areas. They want answers, they want certainty, they want rules. And yet somehow you're saying that, you're talking about the fact that in societies like Norway, Canada, Australia, and so on, that people have gotten past this. I would have thought of it as like a personality type that would be like an obstacle where you would never get to those people and then sort of secularize them. So how do you think this has happened? <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, I, I, man, this is a biggie. I would say with any question of human culture, okay, we're talking about Bronze Age, the, 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 main, the continuation of Bronze Age beliefs, but we could just as easily be talking about dynamics in a marriage or uh, how people, any, anything, any, any issue clearly has innate biological, evolutionary, psychological, neurological aspects and sociological, cultural aspects. And how those things inter, interplay is, is the puzzle. And some of us focus on the innate, the psychological, the neurological. Some of us are focusing on the sociological at the expense of the other. So I think there's a combination at play. And I think uh, on some level, I think there are sociological factors that clearly correlate with a drop in religiosity. And I've already mentioned some of those. But increased education and, and, and secure life. When people have enough food and shelter and medicine and education and, and comfort, they seem to no longer need these bronze age, bronze age superstitions. On the other hand, I think there is a growing body of evidence that suggests there is some neurological wiring going on here. Um, and it may very well be that these are inheritable, possibly. I mean, I hate to say this as a social scientist, but I think that there's a combination here. So it may very well be that there's something about Scandinavians that is sociological, but also in innate and genetic. And I don't know what that is, um, but, uh, but there's something sociological. However, one person did a study of, really interesting study, where he looked at Germans today in Germany and third or fourth generation Americans whose great-great-grandparents had come from Germany. And are now and have been in the, in the United States for three, four generations. So basically, looking at kind of at cousins, cousins that stayed in Germany, and cousins that who's had come to the United States, and the ones who were in the United States were far more religious than the people in Germany today, which suggests that there's something about the society here in the United States that is conducive towards religiosity that's different in Germany. But uh, so I don't know the answer, but it's very complex, and I think there's a mix of sociological factors, and we could name what those are, and neurological factors, and I couldn't name Can what I those are. Um, I mean, I, I think that one of the factors that, that you didn't necessarily mention just now is that um, there's a difference in German society as well, which is that it's more uh, homogenous. And so, you know, if you have a totally homogenous society, and obviously it's not totally homogenous, but if you have a very homogenous society where people surrounding one another for centuries have had the same background, the same experiences, the same history, the same culture, etc., um, it's going to be a little easier for them, I would strongly suspect, to form what could be considered a, a kind of cohesive community environment in their neighborhood, in their community, without the need for their particular church, synagogue, et cetera, et cetera. Because as you know, I mean, you go to any church, synagogue, et cetera, around here, and it's not just a gathering of people with the same beliefs. It's people who dress the same, who talk the same, who look the same, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, I wonder, I mean, do you think that, that par that's part of the issue that, that, you know, in America, there's more need for these sort of community units, like with these buildings and whatever, because the, the society is so diverse and these neighborhoods around here are so diverse? Indeed. I just had a thought, though, Greg, that we should, we should start Zuckerman and Epstein Law Firm here in Santa Monica. <laughs> like, we would really get a lot of clients, don't you think? We could just put up a shingle. Um, no, I... I, no, I am. <laughs> but I, I raise that because it's, it's no accident to me that we're both of Jewish families. And, and Jews are, in fact, the most secular people on planet Earth, depending on how you measure these things, but in terms of belief. So again, what's going on there? Is that genetic? Is it sociological? What's the deal? Um, now, Greg raised a point about 
diversity and homogeneity. I have lived in Scandinavia for two years, and I would definitely agree with Greg that, for example, in Denmark, there's such a strong sense of Danishness that pervades life. They're a, pra- they're a modern tribe. I mean, not only do they speak an obscure language, but they dress similarly, they eat similar foods, all the kids have similar childhood experiences, they're all in the same preschools together. I mean, it's, it's very, very, very homogenous. So in a sense, they draw on a sense of community uh, from just being Danish in Denmark. And, and they don't, and, and, and the Lutheran tradition is part of that, but in a very diluted way, in a traditional kind of cultural Christianity way. And I agree that when, they're, when you're in a society like Los Angeles, where there's so many different languages, so many different ethnicities, so many different races, so many different nationalities, so many different people, that, um, that, that cohesiveness is, is not so easy to attain. And religion is one of the things that you can get that from. So you can go to a church to be with people like you ethnically, hum- uh, racially, nationalistically, or whatever, linguistically. So I think there's something to be said for that, for sure. Thank you. Yeah, we could say more, but... <laughs> Could humanists be missing out on the placebo effect, which is activated by faith and prayer? Now, the placebo effect is very powerful, it cures diseases, makes people happy, does wonderful things. So um, the uh, Harvard uh, Medical uh, School professor, Herbert Benson, uh, did uh, some interesting studies on this. Um, And one of them was, uh, how do people respond when they know they're being prayed for? Um, Do do they get sicker? Do they get better? Um, Actually, uh, they don't get any better at all. Um, But, but. That's one, that's one way of looking at it. On the other hand, I think you make uh, an important point. Um, Herbert Benson is also known for um, his groundbreaking work uh, on a little book that I write up in my book called The Relaxation Response, um, which is uh, essentially a study of uh, the world's great traditions of prayer and meditation. Um, and what he found was that in every type, uh, major type of prayer or meditation, whether uh, in the Abrahamic quote-unquote religions or in the Eastern religions, including yoga, um, etc., there is a certain physiological response that is activated. Think about it. If you sit in a relaxed way um, and you take a few minutes a day um, and you breathe normally and healthily and you're not thinking about what comes next in your life or what just happened that embarrassed the crap out of you, um, you know, and you're just focused on that moment and you're, you're content to maybe repeat a, a few words or a sound yes. um, or perhaps a, an inspiring line of poetry or uh, just count your breath. Uh, what happens is the fight or flight response that, that everyday life kind of triggers in us where, ah, you know, I have to, I have to deal with my job and all the, you know, right, that you, it, it's, it's. Uh, brought back into a relaxation response. Mm -hmm. And it's essentially making the placebo effect work for us and Mm -hmm. making us healthier. uh, The people's uh, uh, cardiac health improves dramatically. People's happiness improves dramatically. Ability to make good decisions uh, has been measured as as improving dramatically based on this this kind of technique. But that's not a placebo response necessarily. We can do that on purpose. We can say, and we do this, we have weekly meditation groups within our uh, community at Harvard, um, where you can can say, this is something, this is an activity, it's a secular activity that we're going to get together. Not everybody likes it, not everybody should. Uh, But, you know, those of us who want to uh, have a little bit less fight or flight response, a little less anxiety in our everyday lives, it can be very helpful. And it can be done on purpose. Frankly, I prefer sex. (laughs) (laughs) But, uh, but meditation will work, I guess. Um, <laughs> she's not into community. No, um, just kidding. <laughs> yes, they do. No. Uh, sorry to be facetious. <laughs> sorry, Greg. <laughs> um, <laughs> any, uh, okay, thanks for that. Um, this is what I would say. If I understand your question, you're saying that there can be great benefits if you think God is looking out for you, and if you believe in angels, and if you believe these things, it can make life easier to deal with. It can make 
that airplane landing not so stressful. It can maybe even make you healthier and happier. And there are a lot of studies, actually, a lot of uh, Christian scholars show the, the benefits of religious faith in, in coping with the stress or this or that. Those, those studies also are challenged by counter studies. But ultimately, ultimately, my response to you is once you know it's not true, I mean, what, what are we supposed to pretend? You know, if someone said to me, look, just believe that there are 14 bunnies that can talk to each other in the woods tonight and you'll feel better. Even if I wanted to feel better, I I couldn't force myself to believe it. Even if I knew it would make me feel better. So I think even if we are missing out on the placebo effect, well, too bad. It's time to grow up. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my hand is... (laughs) I'm just a shitty me- meditator, is what the truth. <laughs> yeah, my hand is so sweaty. I don't know why I'm here. What I want to ask it, but by listening to the lecture that happened this morning with them, uh, and then listening to you, for me, I just say why mm, that looking at what's happening around the world, like for example, the Arab Spring and uh, Occupy Wall Street. I feel, you know, at the present moment, at this time, and, you know, what's happening again around the world, um, any kind of ideology, any kind of belief, I feel to some extent to what you were saying, I want to look at it as the practical aspect of any of these things in a case of not becoming intellectual in intellectualizing it or saying, oh, this is my belief, it's better belief, or that belief is not, you know, in the stuff that I feel, which I don't want to say you project that, but I, re- I want to say that can we really at this time, at this point of the history, could we emphasize a lot on the, the importance of the human beings to each other? When, like, if I realize if, if one, if I'm her, if, my neighbor is hurting, I, should, I am hurting. So to emphasize on the community building, and like for example, few, a year ago, I was really becoming hopeless about what's going, around, what's going to happen, and then I see what, when, when what happened in the, in, in, with Arab Spring, despite all the <laughs> fascist government, that's why it makes me even really more hopeful about the human being, how they stand up for their freedom, you know, how they are getting killed. And, and then how that was a less, I think that kind of motivated people, you know, people from, who are uh, demonstrating in, in New York, in, you know, all over the United States, some places in the United States. It just really seeing that and how we could talk more about how we could bring people together you know, what can we do to help to, <laughs> to just help about bringing a better world, making people to realize the importance of their connection to each other and the community and people who are able to financially um, have make it better, like maybe they have to put more effort in bringing people together more. So I don't know whether it makes sense or not, but I just think it's really important to, at this time, about what's happening and you know, around the world, just pay, pay attention. I think we're all in agreement with your sentiments. It's so important, yeah, what you. you're saying. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, the thing that strikes me is I know that there are a number of people in this room today um, that are here because they just want to see something happen, and, and they care. Um, and so, you know, my friends, uh, Greg and Andy and Emma and, um, Debbie and, and Nicola and, and others, uh, you know that you're out there and we're going to build this thing together, not because we were so into one ideology or whatever, but because we care and, um, we're, we know that we're not going to be told not to be thoughtful about it. I mean, we, we, you know, if, if we see an idea as true, then we're going to have to acknowledge that it's true and, and try to organize around it. And I think that's why, that's why we care. Um, and and it's, the, the most important thing is just talking now about how do we bring people together around it. And bringing people together ought to mean making the world a better place for all human beings. 
Marcy. <laughs> Remember my name. Um, so I love the idea of developing humanistic communities, and there needs to be an alternative for people who are non-religious. Um, but I think some of your answers also touched on some of my concerns about what humanism may be lacking for people who are looking for, for something more. Um, the idea that you know, people also need um, some other connection, maybe you're looking for some kind of um, something, an emotional experience, or um, you were talking before about you know, people who, uh, who have you know, a meditative experience or some sort of inspirational um, experience. You spoke at our uh, at a Yom Kippur service about this idea of awism, um, something that lifts them higher and enables them to find a deeper place within themselves or something that spurs them on. And definitely community service and finding something outside yourself is one aspect of that. But there's also something internal where people work on themselves. And I think people often find that in their religion, whether it's the cultural component of their religion, even if they're non-believers. I think there are a lot of non-believers that still go to a religious service. And it's you know, part of it is for community, which may be replaced with um, a humanistic community center, but part of it also is to find some form of inspiration, and it's not necessarily in a higher being. Sometimes it's just inspi- an inspiration to be a better person, or it's a connection with your ancestors, or it's something beyond um, just yourself. Well... <laughs> Man, um, I would think that different things inspire different people. And so you're not going to get it in one thing. I mean, for some people, it's just being out in nature. And that's really inspiring to them. But other people, it doesn't quite do it. And other people, it's music. And other people, it's stories. And other people, it's a, a, a charismatic speaker. Or So I just, I would, I would, but I would simply acknowledge that, yes, there is that need. And we can't ignore it. And we can't deny that for some people, that's what they're needing. And that's what's going to sustain them or inspire them. And I just would think that Greg has his work cut out for him in that, <laughs> uh, in that it, it, it's not, it, there's, there's so many things that have to be uh, addressed. And, and I also would commend the UUs for this. I mean, I think the Unitarian Universalists do an excellent job of both creating community and inspiring people. And, uh, and I think uh, it's a great model. And there's a lot of great humanistic Jewish groups like yours and, and others. I mean, the, the thing that inspired me um, to try to start this humanist community project is that um, there are all these little pockets, all these little dots of community around the country that are getting aspects of this. And we, we had an experience in our community where, you know, when we started meeting weekly um, and we had our own space to meet in because we raised the funds and we, we, we made that happen, um, we started seeing the same people again and again. And we started getting to know them, and they started getting to know one another in these very new ways. And so um, to see a guy who um, really started to like our community, and then um, he and he was coming every week, and then uh, his cancer came back. He, he had... Um, uh, he had a, a form of cancer that uh, that you know had, he'd had it for ten years, or, or, you know, he'd, or he had it ten years ago, and then and it had gone into remission and it came back, and he needed surgery, and he was really worried about it, and he he got in touch with people in the group, and they called him up, and they but you guys all have these stories. I mean, you know, I, I'm just giving you one little thing, but then to see him then say. Um, as soon as he had recovered from the surgery, the first thing that he wanted to get in the car and do was to drive to our next weekly meeting that he could make. And it's just one tiny little story, but you know, he, he said to us, um, you know, I know that my friends and family are going to be there for me for the first couple weeks after the surgery. I've, I experienced it last time, and I know they will be. But I also know that they're human, and after two, three, four weeks, they're going to start forgetting and I would really value having a community that would keep calling me up a little bit and keep, keep checking on me. And we can do that. And we can have art and music, et cetera, that, that kind of reminds us to. Um, it's not, it's not going to be easy. I mean, actually, mentioning the story makes me think, oh, I haven't called him in a few weeks. I should check, <laughs> you know? Um, but I, I, I think that we just, if, if we're telling each other those stories on a weekly basis 
And not that you got to show up every week. Please don't think that I'm thinking that you have to join the humanism religion and you have to show up every week and you're going to be docked seven demerits if you don't. You know, you're probably, many of you, you know, here, uh, uh, you know, are probably going to want to show up once a year. You know, there's going to be something about, but if it's there, then the next year when something else happens in your life and you want to show up much more often, it's going to be there for you. Hi. I think my question actually is a nice compliment to Marcy's. Um, you know, a lot of the talk here has been on, on the individual and the individual um, individual movement away from, from these established relig- religions towards humanism and the shifts in the, in the statistics that you talked about. But, like, when you think about the established religions and perhaps the more conservative to orthodox forms, there's going to be, when you think in terms of couples, partners, and even compare it to something um, like the LGBT community. In all of those scenarios, you're going to have like-minded couples. But then when you think that there's this shift towards humanism, it, it, nowhere more than there are you going to have scenarios where one person is starting to have that mentality change, but the partner might be you know, still very much um, b- a believer in one of these organized forms of religions. In my case... Um, my wife is is an Irish is Irish Catholic, and I'm I'm Jewish, but moving towards humanism. And there there are very real, concrete um, bumps in that road. You know, just the other day, she was uh, you know she had always embraced the fact that we could coexist as two religions. But then she was saying, you know, I don't know if I can handle if if you don't believe if there's an afterlife because like you know what's going to happen to us. After we die, you know, if I think there's an afterlife and you don't. So my question is, um, how does this movement, um, how does it embrace the, the, the couples, basically, where one person is, is a humanist and the other one is still uh, a believer? I, I had this, we, I did, we did a kind of a similar event to this, not with Phil, though, with, with a couple of other people in New York um, last week. And a very sweet guy stood up and said, you're, you're going to save families because, you know, my, my wife wants to go to stuff and I don't, but I could go to this with her. And you know, so, um, you know, hopefully, you know, we'll provide an opportunity for families to get involved in something that, that otherwise wouldn't be able to do it together. Um, but, you know, in, in terms of this, um, I, I would say um, that when I do weddings or funerals, and I was just explaining to this to, to, uh, to a couple that I'm working with uh, in here, actually, that, that um, I often hear from somebody in the family, um, you're not going to talk about God in the, in the ceremony? What, you know, I, I, how can you not do that? I mean, we, we have to, right? Like, like, the, like the Republicans panicking that Obama called Thanksgiving a celebration of community as opposed to... Uh, you know, right, so there's always somebody that, that seems like they're going to panic, but more often than not, if you provide somebody with a ceremony or a moment or a community gathering or whatever that, as Marcy was talking about, calls them to you know invokes in them the the the, the desire to celebrate other people and especially the people around them that they care about, um, they're not necessarily going to notice the the stuff about what happens after after you're dead. Um, if you really give people a chance to connect to the people that they care about or to be able to start to begin to feel a caring connection between somebody that otherwise might be a stranger to them, which is what I think effective community does, they're going to all of a sudden their worries about the afterlife can sort of dissolve a little bit. I'm not saying every case, but that's what I think people want. People, when somebody dies and you're doing a funeral, you know, people talk a lot about wanting uh, a sense of God's presence. But, you know, if God's present with you after your loved one dies, but you don't have anybody to come along and give you a hug, it's not going to be that great. What people want is the presence of other people. Thanks. Uh, I f- uh, sounds tough. You got a wife that's Irish Catholic and believes in heaven, and you don't, and that sounds tricky. Um, and I, I've often wondered, because me and my wife are definitely on the same page in terms of our beliefs on that. We disagree slightly about something. I don't know, but um, <laughs> but not on that. And I've often asked myself, could I be married to a believer? You know, I'd like to think I could. I would like to think that I, of course, I could. And if I loved the person, and and my good friend Rod, who came out with me to Claremont, you've been married what for forty nine years, Rod? Forty nine. 
49 years, his wife's Catholic, Rod's an atheist, and, and we were talking the whole drive out here about how they navigated that for f nearly 50 years. And they kind of had some ground rules where they just said, well, you know, we can talk about our differences, but we're not going to ever uh, ridicule each other's position, and we're not going to put it down, and we will just, you know, so on. I mean, so there's probably ways and techniques that you can do that, but, but I do think it would be tricky because you want to be honest with your partner. You don't want to lie and say, okay, I believe it too, just to make them happy. You want to have, there's an integrity to your position, and you, it's your position. What can you do? But I would say that this is going to be a more and more challenging phenomenon. I mean, more and more people are going to be in your shoes. Right. So I would, I would just like to think that these humanist communities could help with that, with that bridge, mm -hmm. with, that, with that interface. Right. Um, that's, that's what I would think uh, would, be, would be some kind of help there. But do you have kids? Uh, we've only been married three years, and we want to have okay, kids. Because so. I think it's going to get even trickier when you have kids, not to, not to bum your Sunday out or anything. Well. But, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, and, and, and in fact... The studies there are there are some studies that show that nothing uh, that the religiosity of children or the lack of religiosity is strongly correlated to their parents, and so in fact when you have um, you know two parents that are believers, the child's most likely to be a believer. When you have two parents that are non-believers, the children are much more likely to be non-believers themselves. And when it's one or the other, it's kind of in the middle, and it also is different if it's the mother that's the non-believer or the father and the kind of relationship you have. But it's clearly yeah, indeed. Um, but uh, yeah, so I think uh, I think you sh there's probably there's probably uh, I don't know there's I'm certainly there's there's got to be some therapist in the crowd. Get their card, and I'm sure they can <laughs> counsel you and your wife. Just a quick postscript: uh, You were talking about y unions. When we tried to get married, uh, we wanted to have a rabbi and a priest together, but we had already decided we wanted to do it on a boat. The Catholic Church in, in this diocese would not allow us to get married outside of a, of a church. So um, we try to have my, my, my family's friend do it, who's a judge, but he's a New York judge, and he was not uh, or, you know, ordained or whatever you want to call it. So we got married by the captain. So there's the answer, the captain of the ship. So. And his name was Chaim O'Malley. He was Jewish. Oh, there you go. I'm just, uh, I'm looking at the time. I'm going to say, let's take the last couple of questions. Okay. And, uh, and then I've got one final question and a wrap up. And also to let you guys know that we can continue this conversation in the beautiful weather outside. Please join us for some refreshments uh, in the informal portion. But let's take the last couple of questions and then we'll bring this to a close. Um, religious activities are usually on the weekends. Uh, just to add to your list of uh, items that might be considered for its downfall, uh, one is uh, after the, the, the morning uh, weekend television programs, and, and the other is the recreational activities for the kids that are organized so that you can't be in two places at one time. If you're going to be at the baseball game or at the soccer game, you can't be in church or wherever. Um, very quickly, though, um, people will say to a humanist, why or secularist, why is it that uh, you have a, 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 or how can you possibly have a sense of good without the concept of, of, of a deity? And of course, the answer, obviously, is that we are in a community that reinforces what is, in fact, considered to be good or evil or what have you. Uh, but along that line, some of the consequences, many of the consequences that occur, in fact, the overwhelming majority of consequences that occur in human behavior are aversive. Uh, if you don't believe me, try walking out of here with your eyes closed, and you'll see what consequences will be of this everyday, minimal, invasive kind of strategy. Uh, what happens with religion is that you can uh, attempt to do something, whether it's a ritual or some prayer or some thought, and then if the consequences, the negative consequences, are not there, then you have succeeded. That goes into the plus column. That is, I've, thanks to the fact that I went through this ritual, this superstition, as we say, you have now been saved or spared the negative consequences. There is nothing that can prevent 
that kind of, 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 of mechanism. And consequently, you simply have to begin by saying, I'm not going to do that. And, and, and that takes a tremendous amount. It's like, don't, don't say the ritual, don't go through that, and see what happens. And, and uh, religion thrives on that. Thank you. Uh, to your first part, I would also add the mall as a secularizing effect. Uh, I assume that when a lot of people here were younger, on Sundays you couldn't shop. Everything was closed. And of course, capitalism has triumphed there, and now you can go shopping on Sundays. And I think the mall, if you look at a church, look at, look at the parking lots at the mall at the West Side Pavilion on a Sunday, and you'll see that it's stiff competition for the churches. For your second thing, I I agree with you. There's something there. There's something about the magical thinking of religion that's really compelling. And I tried it one time. I thought I I was teaching a night class in Rancho Cucamonga. And to drive back to Claremont on on baseline, if you got the green light pattern, you sail all the way through every light. And now you were home in 10 miles, you know, in 10 minutes. But if you were off, you kept hitting the red light each time. And it took twice as long. And, you know, and so one night I thought, well, I'm going to try to pray to Pan Pan was always my favorite uh, deity from the Greek <laughs> myths. So I said, come on, Pan. I really want to get the green lights. I want to get home. And I want to see what this is like. And I prayed really, really hard, really, really hard, really, really hard. And I got the red light. And I immediately said, oh, Pan knows that there's a drunk driver f- three blocks ahead <laughs> and is stopping me. And I, you know what? It actually... Explained, it helped me understand religion tremendously. That exercise, I thought, okay, a religious person always has an out. If I had gotten the green lights, I would have said, look, Pan answered my prayers. I didn't get the green light, but Pan was still looking out for me. And that's when I realized there's something psychological going on, and I don't think secularists are ever going to be able to compete with that. People are going to succumb to that magical thinking or not. Um, a close relative of my wife's was recently diagnosed with breast cancer and somehow saw this all as God's beneficence, like, oh, you know, the doctor found it just in time, so God was looking out for me, as opposed to, why the hell did God give me breast cancer? I mean, if you're going to think that way, then you're always going to be able to figure it out, and I think there's always going to be people that are going to look at the world that way. So, I, you know, I think there's always going to be a place for religious slash magical thinking. It's just too, too powerful. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. I mean, that, that's, the, the idea is not to, to conquer the world and make it the, the, the perfect humanist paradise, which is never going to exist. The, the idea is, is to, um, to bring together the people that are, that are uh, benefiting from this and, and show them, you know, we can benefit even more and we can benefit society if we bring each other, each other together. Um, I also thought that he was the, the, the question with the, you know, good without God. I thought he was going to say that, and the answer is in your two books, but. Uh. <laughs> so, uh, America, we have a very militarized culture, even if we don't know it. Um, and I know in the military they have a lot of religious groups, but I've heard of humanists being discriminated against. And I was wondering, are there humanist groups in the military? And also, do you think that humanism and the peace movement share common goals? And what can we do about that? Thanks, Mike. Uh, Short answer, yes. Uh, There's a pervasive evangelical Christian culture in America's military. Kind of ironic, isn't it? (laughs) It's easy to shoot people when God's on your side. Yeah, but I mean, you would think someone might read the Sermon on the Mount or the Sermon on the Plain and think, oh, I thought Jesus preached nonviolence. But... Be that as it may, there's no question we've heard reports of Jews and atheists feeling discriminated, being discriminated against. Uh, Military personnel have to fill out a psychological profile test, which has a spiritual fitness component. And so if they mark that they were non-believers, they were sent to a chaplain to discuss their inadequacies. And so there have been some lawsuits filed now by uh, military uh, uh, people who felt discriminated against, denied promotion, or abso- actually denied uh, vacation, uh, like weekend leave because their commanding officers, they, had, they weren't right with God. They had to stay and clean the barracks. So there have been lawsuits, and now there are these groups growing. One is MASH. Mil- Ma- Military Association of Atheists and Free Thinkers. Military Association of Atheists and Free Thinkers. Yeah. So <laughs> they're, they're emerging all over. Um, and uh, I think it's going to be a growing movement for sure. But, but, say it again. Today's LA Times has a story on a group. Thank you. Okay. 
Excellent. And I've been in touch with a couple of these guys trying to you know, on email, nothing more, but I hope to interview them soon for something I'm working on now. But uh, I think the peace movement obviously uh, has a lot in common with the goals of humanism, for sure. Um, the uh, director of Military Association of Athe Atheists and Freethinkers is uh, my friend Jason Torpy, and they've got a very good website. And so you, you can learn factually about uh, the, the large number of, of humanists and, and freethinkers in the military today. Uh, because, and why not? It's a young group, and, and that's one thing that we know for sure. Uh, is our is our demographics among young people? Um, the interesting thing is the their uh, latest big project is to try to to, uh, to get chaplains, in, humanist chaplains, endorsed in the military and humanist lay leaders as well, which is a different category. But the the, the point being um, that even you know our our sort of military branch of the movement uh, literally is um, is thinking well, what we need is some uh, some community. Uh, facilitation, um, some professional representation, um, some options for, for our folks to go to um, because, you know, the reason why these uh, religious guys are there, um, it, it, you know, there, there's a real reason, which is that, you know, the, the soldiers need somebody that they can talk to um, that's well-trained in how to talk to them and how to guide them through important moments and whatever. Uh, when you go to a therapist, um, the, you know, that, that's put on your mental health record um, in the military, whereas you can go to a chaplain and have your conversation be completely confidential. Um, and so, look, if there's a need for a role like that, then fine. But then why not have uh, people who are trained in humanism and who, who sympathize with the humanist worldview able to serve soldiers in that way, too? And that's, that's I think you're going to see that in, as a theme emerging, is that, you know, we can make community our way, our friendly way of just advancing our cause without being against anybody. But, you know, we deserve recognition for our community and we're going to go and get it and take it if necessary. Thanks. All right. Well, to, uh, to finish up this portion of, uh, of the afternoon, I'm going to throw out the last question and sort of bring it back into within the confines of this congregation. It may make some of my fellow church members a little uncomfortable, but I'm going to put it out there. So Unitarian Universalists have held pretty steady between six and 700,000 for a couple of generations now. Um, along, I mean, I guess that's good news compared to the Catholics and some of the main scene Protestants that are dropping off like flies. But here's my question. With this growing trend in irreligion, what will be the continued relevance of congregations like this one and Unitarian Universalism. If you have Unitarian Universalist churches that are already dallying with non-theism, will we have any continued, re uh, any continued reason for being? So here's your chance to look at the tea leaves. <laughs> well, uh, all right, I'll be totally honest, uh, and this may make Greg uncomfortable too, but when I first heard about what Greg was trying to do, I actually thought, hey, and I said this to you when we first met, hey, you got the Unitarian Universalists. I mean, why reinvent the wheel? They got the buildings, they got the songbooks, they've got the chalice, uh, they got the pews, uh, they got the courtyards, they got the probably the graham crackers. So, what's the deal? Um, I think, but but what I would like to see is, I, I love what Greg's trying to do with un bringing things together, c c getting some cohesion. But also, why shouldn't there be different flavors and varieties of such congregational options for people, depending on the community, the type of community? So uh, I, think, uh, I think they could exist side by side, reinforcing, reinforcing each other. I mean, if you've got Reconstructionist Judaism and you've got Reformed Judaism and you've got uh, Panay Or uh, and, um, and Humanist Judaism, I mean, surely you could have different flavors and types of humanist congregations as well. Um, so, yeah, there, there are all these different options. I mean, um, Unitarian Universalism is a denomination that emerged out of two liberal church groups, right? So it's, it's Christian culturally. Um, there have been other elements injected into it, um, but this is culturally Christian humanism. Um, and, you know, it, there are some Jews that feel perfectly comfortable here, but, you know, but then there's a whole range of people who have different cultures besides the Protestant culture that produced uh, this meeting and this meeting house. Um, 
And, you know, they're just, as Phil said, and I, I mean, I totally agree with you. There's a so, there are so many different ways to do it, and this is one of them. Um, and we need to get all the different ways that people are doing this out there to start looking at one another because, you know, we believe in evolution and continuing to evolve. And so if we figure, you know, if, if, the, if the group that created this building um, was one point on the, you know, on, on sort of the evolution of humanism, are we not going to continue to evolve? You know, it's like, oh, well, we came up with a model in 1961. We had a merger of the Unitarians and the Universalists. We're set. I mean, that, that, attitude, that attitude would kill us. Um, and so what I would just say is that um, I, I tell a story in my book about the uh, about Unitarian Universalist um, conference where, that I attended and spoke at where, um, where a, there was a meeting about Unitarian Universalist humanism. Um, which has always been sort of one of the main factors in Unitarian Universalism, but some would say it's sort of in decline among some aspects of the UU organization. And, and so um, the, uh, you know, a, a UU humanist stood up in a meeting of UUs and said, are you going to miss us when we're gone? Because, you know, because the, the, the UU organization had been pushing more religion, more re- you can do any, you, you can be a humanist in UU, you can be a Christian, you can be a Buddhist, you can be a Wiccan, whatever. Um, but that doesn't mean that, that there's necessarily going to be an accepting place for humanists within an individual congregation the way that you've created here. The Unitarian Universalist uh, you know, meeting, the, 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 one, of the, one of the leaders of the meeting responded, why can't you just let us have our metaphors? Um, and, you know, and we can have that sort of push and pull go back and forth, but the point is, you know, those, of, those of us who are UUs, let's organize meetings like this for UU humanists specifically. Let's not have them all just be back and forth discussion, you know, as I love listening to Phil. I mean, this is a real treat for me. But I I think in future meetings, you know, we might want to have um, some talking and some discussion and some music and art and food and all the. And I think you guys have the potential to build all of that. And then you, you humanists, will be one of the leaders of the humanist movement of the future, among other options. And I'm excited to see it. So thank you. Thank you for organizing this, Ian. So, Oz members, we've been talking about what we're doing after this. I think we just got ourselves a hint. So, here, let me, let me make this all formal here. So, um, we're going to bring this part of the uh, afternoon to a close. Um, I don't have a dollar figure for you, but uh, here's a visual representation of your generosity. Thank you very much. Um, your contributions are going to go towards supporting programs like this, as well as probably supporting some people and some works whose values we all share in our hope for the growth of a rational worldview. If you'd like to be kept informed, we've got a, a sign-up sheet. We hope you've left your contact information. And with that, I'd like to offer a warm round of applause to our guests. And I'd like to thank all of you for coming out on this Sunday afternoon. Please join us in the courtyard for some refreshments, and let's continue this uh, human communion. <laughs>